ahead and get started. So would like to welcome everyone and thank you all for joining us today. We're very excited to have you all here for an exciting presentation and panel discussion on the topic of country readiness for the introduction of long acting HIV treatments. My name is Zach Panos and I lead CHI's HIV treatment and market intelligence team as part of our global HIV access program. And I'm joined here by a few of my colleagues, including Carolyn Amel, who's the Senior Director for HIV Access at CHI and will be the one moderating our panel discussion. Before we get into the, the presentation and panel, wanted to start with a poll to the group. And we have a few polls throughout, um, really just trying to, to engage the audience and hear some thoughts from you all in terms of, um, you know, how ready are we right now as a global community to, uh, to introduce long acting treatments? So hopefully this poll has popped up for you all um, and uh, we'll welcome uh, we'll welcome votes for for a minute uh, and then uh, we can dive into the meat of the presentation. Okay, I'm seeing some responses come in. Hopefully the responses are also visible. Um, seems like we're split between um, we will be ready soon to introduce these products and we are are not ready. Um, happily see that uh, a very small percent of people think that we are way behind um, and excited to see some optimism that uh, that we are ready today. I think there is definitely a lot of work to do as we will get into uh, with this presentation. So I'll leave this up just for another moment or so and let, uh, well, no, it'll block the screen. Um, so we'll close the poll, but thank you everyone for participating. 43% of people said that will be ready soon. Uh, 25 said not ready, and then you know a few other selections. But we can go ahead and dive in. So if we can go to the next slide, to orient everyone to the agenda today, we'll start by briefly setting the scene about the future of HIV treatment and how long acting treatments will be paradigm changing. We'll then dive into the methodology and the high level findings from the long acting HIV treatment readiness assessment conducted by CHI with ministry partners and communities. And then we'll close with our panel discussion uh, with Ministry of Health representatives and key opinion leaders from Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa. We can go to the next. So right now we're at a bit of an inflection point with HIV treatment. Since the beginning of the epidemic, treatment with daily oral pills has been the standard of care. First with singles and syrups, then with duals, and now of course the triple fixed dose combinations like TLD. And we're now just entering the era of long acting treatments, currently as injectables, but with long acting orals and implants further in the pipeline. However, as we'll get to in a minute, there's almost no access to these in LMICs today. And the advent of these new modalities will impact all aspects of the HIV response, given the current response has been built around the paradigm of daily oral pills, everything from procurement and quantification to how we approach service delivery and as we innovate with differentiated service delivery. If we go to the next slide, I've overlaid some of these you know, high level product formulation innovations to a graph showing treatment scale up in LMICs. And HIV treatment optimization, both in terms of price and also in terms of quality and efficacy, have enabled dramatic scale up of ART and improvements in quality of life over the past two decades. However, there are still millions of people who are not accessing treatment today and many more that are cycling in and out of care given the challenges around daily dosing. And long acting products, we believe, represent an opportunity, although not a silver bullet, to further enable scale up and improve retention and care. And on the next slide, as I mentioned previously, long acting ART will fundamentally off alter the way that HIV treatment services are delivered with a few expected changes listed here, although this is certainly uh, not exhaustive and I'm sure we'll learn much more as we begin to introduce these. First on the left are changes to service delivery. And this includes client flow within facilities, 
who among the healthcare worker cadre is able to administer these new treatment modalities and looking at how current differentiated service delivery models may need to be updated to fit long acting treatments. We also expect additional complexity with treatment sequencing and the dissolution of the historical use of more rigid lines of therapy. There are a number of open questions here, such as how clients may be able or not to switch back and forth between options such as TLD and injectable options, and how will providers manage this in the future? And of course, maybe most excitingly, adding new modalities to the mix will offer the potential opportunity for clients to choose the treatment that works the best for their lifestyle. And this will, of course, have implications for uh, the upstream components as well, such as quantification and distribution of the products throughout the health system. And to wrap up this section on the next slide, here uh, we've shown just a high level snapshot view of the long acting products that are currently approved and those that are in development. On the left, we show the products that are currently available, starting with injectable cabotegravir and opilverine, which are injected together intramuscularly every eight weeks. And all this is, although this is exciting as the first long acting injectable HIV treatment, there are a few challenges that make this combination less optimal for use in LMICs, such as the requirement for cold chain for opilverine, no cross treatment for hepatitis B, as we see with tenofovir containing regimens, and narrow dosing windows uh, needed to avoid resistance. More recently, lenacapavir, the first capsid inhibitor, was approved by the US FDA as a subcutaneous injection administered every six months alongside an optimized background regimen. Although for now, there is not an obvious pair for lenacapavir, a, a, a long acting uh, agent to pair lenacapavir with. And so although lenacapavir is long acting and only injected once every six months, it would likely have to still be administered with daily oral pills in terms of the backbone. And there are a few options currently in development as well. And here we've highlighted just two that are combinations of weekly oral pills. And there are also further products in the early pipeline that we have not shown here. One thing I want to note is that none of these products have yet been licensed for generic development through the medicines patent pool, which poses a high risk to access in LMICs, as it's very unlikely that innovator products would ever scale in LMICs given the high expected costs and lower production capacity. And so we'll now move uh, into just two brief slides highlighting the methodology for the long acting HIV treatment landscape assessment. So we conducted this, this assessment over the past year in partnership with ministries of health in Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa, with the goal of better understanding and supporting the governments in preparing for the ultimate introduction of long acting treatment. We wanted to understand structures and processes currently in place that could be utilized for long acting treatment. We wanted to identify potential barriers to introduction that we could begin to address now and to develop a roadmap for future work to ensure that introduction is rapid and equitable once we have products available, commercialized, and in country. And on the next slide, you'll see that we conducted this in two phases. First, we started with data collection and desk research, uh, just to better understand the landscape and tr experiences introducing long-acting products from other disease areas. And then the meat of the assessment consisted of stakeholder engagement, including consultations and interviews with community members of people living with HIV in each country, Ministry of Health and key opinion leader interviews, and healthcare worker interviews in Nigeria specifically. And now we can dive into the executive summary of the findings, starting with some of the similarities that we found between the countries. Across the board, maybe unsurprisingly, governments and communities of people living with HIV are excited about the potential for long acting products to transform the treatment experience given expected clinical benefits. And the fact that in many cases, users prefer injectable treatments over daily oral pills. None of the countries that we spoke to expected there to be changes to existing registration pathways for these new products. And when it comes to procurement and supply, again, maybe not surprisingly, all countries expressed the importance of uh, supply security with multiple generic manufacturers, if possible. And supply security is seen as particularly important for long acting products, because if, if a facility stocks out of an injectable, clients would have to be moved back onto daily oral pills, which may pose adherence challenges. 
And as I mentioned earlier, we still don't quite know how long acting regimens may be interchangeable with each other or with existing daily oral options. And this was identified uh, last year uh, during the Cato 4 meetings as a key research pro priority to better understand the interchangeability and sequencing of long acting products with our existing set of treatments. And finally, there was some concern about how client choice could impact Oh, previous slide, thanks. Uh, about how client choice will impact quantification and the potential risk of stockouts or overstocks leading to expiries. However, as you can see from the quote on the left, interviewees noted that other programs, such as family planning, are already wrestling with these questions and have experience. And so there's the potential to share knowledge across disease areas, breaking down silos, so that when we begin to introduce long acting treatment, we are not. Uh, not building the plane uh, as we're flying it, so to say. On the next slide, turning to service delivery, country programs expressed persistent training funding gaps, which will be a challenge given that significant training is likely to be required for these new treatment methodologies such as injectables. For example, the cabotegavir ropilverine injectable is more complicated than a simple vaccination and special training is needed. Respondents did note that many healthcare workers are already cross-trained and trained to administer some injections for other disease areas or family planning services, which may reduce the overall training burden. Nigeria and Kenya in our interviews both shared that injections can currently only be given in facilities, which may limit access and disrupt recent differentiated service delivery models, which have aimed to move services out of facilities and into the community to meet people where they are. And finally, both South Africa and Kenya highlighted interest in private sector engagement for delivery of long acting treatments, and we'll speak to the panel about this uh, in a minute. When we move to client monitoring and uptake monitoring, respondents flagged that strong pharmacovigilance processes would be critical given that these new modalities or given that these are new modalities and that they're long acting and stay in the body for a long time. Respondents also noted that client monitoring and follow-up approaches will likely need to be reviewed to ensure they're fit for purpose, as, exi as existing approaches such as pill counting will not work for injectables. Additionally, and as mentioned on the pipeline slide, some of these products have narrow dosing windows that must be maintained to ensure protection and avoid resistance. And so ensuring that clients come back on time and on schedule to receive follow-up injections or changes to an implant in the future will be critical to ensure that people are protected. And on this next slide, we'll move to highlight just a few of the differences that arose during the assessment. When considering initial subpopulations for prioritization, we saw differences in how programs were thinking about this. In South Africa, for example, key opinion leaders indicated that stable and adherent clients may be prioritized. However, Kenya and Nigeria suggested that clients struggling with adherence may be those who are initially targeted for long acting treatments. And when further discussing what client choice may look like, both Kenya and South Africa indicated that client choice may be limited or guided by clinicians. And in all countries, active choice in terms of treatment options is not currently part of the treatment experience for clients under the public health approach, except of course, when there are issues such as intolerance uh, or, or failure. And finally, we saw differences in the desire for local evidence. South Africa often requires local research or data before introducing new products, whereas Kenya and Nigeria reported that they don't always require evidence from their local populations. And I'll call it the quote on the right, on the bottom right, uh, from a key opinion leader in South Africa, reflecting on the fact that the Atlas and Flare trials, which looked at injectable cabotegavir and ropilverine, did not have sufficient numbers of African women included in them, in their opinion. And we also want to highlight specifically uh, some of the common themes on the next slide that came from our community consultations. The first on the upper left is the importance of early community involvement. And we've seen how important this is with recent product introductions such as TLD and Darinavir Ritonavir in second line, where community voices have been pivotal to ensuring equitable access to these optimal products in the face of introduction roadblocks. The second on the upper right is to improve counseling practices to ensure that people living with HIV have the required knowledge to make informed decisions under this new paradigm of client choice. 
respondents that we spoke to in the community often cited having to do their own research or ask specifically for DTG containing products, for example, in the early phases of introduction and reported that they hoped that counseling could improve so that they could make the decision about, you know, do they want an injectable? What are the benefits or drawbacks and how does that compare to what they are currently taking uh, on a daily basis? And as mentioned earlier, there is just general excitement about these new products and the chance to hopefully reduce health system interactions and move away from daily dosing. Although I will flag that depending on the exact product and how it's dosed, there is the chance that some long acting products may actually increase health system interactions. Right now we've seen after COVID-19, the vast majority of people on TLD are receiving three monthly uh, distributions and some countries are moving towards six monthly distributions, which means that people only interact with the health system maybe twice a year. And as we showed on the pipeline slide right now, cabotegavir ropivirine requires dosing every eight weeks, which is significantly more frequent than many clients are currently accessing their ART. And so what the reduction in health system interactions looks like will depend on the future products and what those dosing windows look like. And a big part of this excitement uh, was around the potential to reduce stigma and discrimination, given that long acting methods are likely to be more discreet and don't require carrying around bottles of pills. And finally, community respondents also flagged the importance of choice to ensure their buy in to their treatment and flagged that not everyone will want an injection, and that's okay. However, the literature is largely si silent on client preferences for HIV treatment modalities and LMICs. Although there is some research, there is significantly more when it comes to prevention, and this remains a research gap. So where does this leave us? And what are the next steps that country programs can take uh, to prepare while generic products get licensed and developed? And on this slide, as part of our assessment, we worked with programs to identify potential preparatory steps to improve readiness for these long acting products. Right now is the time to focus on these gaps so that once we do have products available and in country, we can focus on the introduction itself and not on the system readiness pieces as well. And this list here is certainly not exhaustive. The timing of these projects may differ in different countries based on their local context, but hopefully could be used as a bit of a menu for programs that are thinking about and excited to introduce long acting products, but aren't quite sure where to start. So starting at the top and going down, the first potential project uh, related to stakeholder engagement is to conduct a mapping of stakeholders in country, including their potential concerns, and develop a communications and advocacy plan for sensitization to prepare them and uh, make sure that they are knowledgeable about these new products, their pros and cons, and how they may be introduced in a given country. Related to forecasting and quantification, programs could right now begin to proactively work with family planning teams to understand how they've incorporated client choice into their supply planning and how they've worked to mitigate challenges such as stockouts or expiries. This could also be a chance to begin speaking with communities of people living with HIV and doing research to, to uh, discern how people in a given country or region would prefer to receive their treatments. Would they prefer to receive them uh, daily oral? Would, are they interested in injectables? We expect that this will vary based on country. And so doing some sort of country specific research uh, will be useful as we begin to think about forecasting and quantification and procuring these products. And under the umbrella of procurement, uh, programs can conduct an analysis on national supply chain and warehousing capacity to inform any changes that may be needed for long acting treatments. Once we're talking about, uh, you know, vials of an injection or implants rather than pills. And in the case that there are specific requirements such as cold chain, as is the case for ropivirine based long acting injectables right now. Moving towards service delivery. Programs can conduct mapping exercises of existing healthcare worker capacity by cadre, location, licensure, to better understand how the health workforce is or is not prepared for long acting products. Conducting a feasibility assessment of what it would mean to update policies to allow for injections outside of facilities is another step programs can take. And this could also take the form of operational research. Moving down related to systems adaptations, looking at current pharmacovigilance and client follow-up approaches in partnership with people living with HIV will be useful to identify any changes needed with long-acting products. 
And finally, as evidenced by one of the themes called out during the community consultations, partnering with community organizations early on to begin treatment literacy and demand generation will be critical. And this is not something that should wait until products are already being rolled out. That will be too late. I'd also add the importance of engaging communities throughout the planning process itself, and not just focusing on literacy and demand generation, but involving people with li people living with HIV meaningfully at all steps across the new product introduction cascade. And as I said, this is of course not an exhaustive list, but hopefully some food for thought as programs are thinking about where to start uh, or, and how to start preparing for the ultimate advent of long acting treatments. And so this now concludes our brief presentation on the findings from the assessment. And I'd like to take a moment to thank UNITAID who funded this work, as well as the governments of Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa, and communities of people living with HIV who participated in this assessment. And before I pass it over to Carolyn and our panelists to begin uh, the panel discussion, I'd like to launch another poll to this group. Um, to get your thoughts on where along the new product introduction continuum, do you see the biggest challenges to introducing long acting products? Is it in the policy and registration piece, stakeholder engagement, procurement and quantification, service delivery and implementation, or client monitoring? And now maybe we'll ask the panelists if possible to go on video. I see that Carolyn has turned her video on. Thank you. Um, and we can wait for the videos to come on um, as uh, the poll responses come in. All right, we've got about seems quarter of people responding. The vast majority think that service delivery and implementation are going to be some of the biggest challenges. Um, that's the one that I voted for. I think that that one um, is definitely an area where there will need to be a lot of work, a lot of operational research to figure out how we do this. Um, interesting, 2% stakeholder engagement. Seems like people are excited and ready to introduce these products. Not a lot of convincing to do. Um, just wait another moment or so to allow for further responses. And thank you to the panelists for turning on your videos. OK, I think it's pretty clear that uh, service delivery and implementation is the area where we'll need to focus the most over the next few months. And so without further ado, I will now pass it over to Carolyn to introduce our panelists and get the discussion started. Uh, thank you very much and looking forward to the discussion. Great, right. thanks so much, Zach. Um, and hi, everyone. Really nice to be with you today and to see the great turnout on this call. Um, as Zach mentioned, my name is Carolyn Amel and I lead the HIV program at CHAI. Um, I'm excited to moderate the panel, and I wanted to start by introducing uh, my panelist. Um, so first from Nigeria, we have Mrs. Uh, Uzoma Atu, who is an assistant director at the Federal Ministry of Health in Nigeria. She is a pharmacist and well-versed in facilitating uh, countrywide assessments and interventions to inform policy development and adoption, SOPs and guidelines development, quantification of health products, and capacity building of healthcare workers. Her contributions in the HIV program have enabled access to many ARV products and commodities to manage opportunistic infections. Uh, next from Kenya, Dr. Lazarus Momani works at the Kenyan Ministry of Health, NASCOP, as a technical advisor for HIV differentiated service delivery through the uh, ICAP Sequin project. He is a medical doctor and public health specialist with over 12 years of experience designing and implementing HIV AIDS and TB programs, both at the uh, subnational and national level. In his role, he provides technical support at NASCOP that includes design and implementation of client-centered DSD models, development and uh, updating of national guidelines for HIV care and treatment, treatment optimization, advanced HIV disease, and um, integration of services. And lastly, from South Africa, Dr. Lesejo Mawela is technical advisor for HIV TB at Innova Health Institute in South Africa. Um, he's an HIV clinician with over 18 years of experience implementing public health programs 
Um, he has a particular interest in advanced HIV care, HIV prevention, adolescence, and youth programs. He completed postgraduate studies in HIV management and tropical medicine. He has a passion for training, clinical mentorship, and quality improvement. So we've got a fantastic panel here today with extensive and diverse experience. I'm really eager to dive in to the discussion. But actually, before I do, just a reminder that we are keen to take questions from the audience as well. I think if you can pop those questions into the, into the Q&A, um, what I'll do is I have some questions, but then I'll check back to the to the Q&A and we'll try and bring in some of those questions as well. Also, if there were any clarifying questions on Zach's presentation, please do pop those into the Q&A as well and we can um, kind of go back and forth with those questions. Okay, so great. Um, let's start with a question then for all the panelists. One interesting conversation that came up was around client choice um, and how clients could or should be given the opportunity to select the best administration method for their own medications, for example, um, oral versus injectables. I think it's really exciting to see this conversation coming up in the treatment space. Of course, on the prevention side, we've uh, long recognized the importance of offering clients choice in their products, but this does feel like a more recent conversation on the treatment side. Um, so while there are some clear benefits to allowing clients to choose their medications, it will likely pose significant complexity for national programs. For anyone who was at the IAS conference in Australia this year or joined virtually like me, we hosted a really exciting debate on this very topic between uh, Francois Venter and Jackie Wambui during our satellite session. Um, so anyway, my question for the panelists. How do you think your country would grapple with a potential new paradigm of client choice in ART provision? Um, and uh, let me see if any of my panelists want to jump in. Otherwise, I will call on one for that question. Mm. All right. I can I can start. All right. Great. Please start. <laughs> Yes, uh, firstly, just to say thank you for this great um, webinar, um, and I think it was a great presentation, but also the audience. Um, thank you for, for joining um, this great session. Just to say that, um, you know, it's uh, two sides, you know, of the coin, you know, there's the supply side, you know, where mm -hmm. as health workers, we have a quote as well that says uh, the doctor knows best. <laughs> and from the client's side, you know, they also say uh, nothing for us without us, you know, uh, which is uh, very, very important. And I think the, the key uh, uh, challenge for, for, for South Africa particularly is to ensure that on the client's side, we have very strong treatment literacy, you know, programs. Uh, uh, very early on, even before these products become um, available, because I think the earlier we engage, you know, the earlier we get buy-in, the more they are, you know, um, informed. And also considering that South Africa has a very strong, or what I would say, a vibrant uh, civil society, you know, mm. um, and they're quite um, organized. And we have seen this even when a, a product like uh, Dolutegravir was introduced and we as clinicians believed that the product was not uh, maybe recommended for certain populations, uh, particularly in that instance, pregnant women uh, early on because of neural tube defects. And, you know, civil society came to us and said, but why don't you involve us? Why don't you tell us? I think you should allow us to participate um, you know, in the decision, give us the information, you know, give us the positive things, give us the risks, and let's allow every single woman, you know, in the country to decide because civil society felt that the, the benefits of the product probably outweighed uh, oh. uh, the risks. You know, so I think there's there's the two sides. So we have to ensure that civil society communities and the clients are empowered, but also to ensure that clinicians themselves they are ready for a for an empowered uh, community mm -hmm. which may and you know a certain service uh, or a product. I think the biggest challenge then would be where these two people meet, which is at the health systems you know level, because. When you have uh, multiple products, it means that now your supply chain processes might be, you know, a bit uh, complex. It also means that 
there might be a dilution in terms of volume and therefore these products might remain a bit you know expensive versus if it was one product for all the seven million <laughs> people in the country then we could negotiate you know um, um, a bit mm -hmm. more um, when you get to the actual uh, facilities, you know, the, the, the way the flow of the client, you know, depending on the choice, because sometimes our health facilities are not designed to provide injectables, for example, mm -hmm. in every single <laughs> consultation room. So one of the challenges is the reorganization uh, in terms of how the, the clients would, would actually flow to, to receive the different uh, products. There's uh, challenges as well. Uh, as we speak in South Africa, we don't even have enough storeroom, for example, for condoms. Now, when you have mm -hmm. multiple products, is the question of, you know, storage capabilities uh, at different levels uh, of the of the health system, you know, um, and then the training of health workers, etc. But in in my honest view, I think that we do have a, a quite number of models where the client choice has been introduced, especially as we referenced, you know, our family planning. And I think mm -hmm. as a company, one of the things is to take stock of some of the best practices. What is it that we can learn in those uh, kinds of, of situations? I also want to say as I close, also in terms of adoption, it's important to engage our communities. We have seen it with uh, COVID-19. I remember the grannies in my community saying, when HIV started, you guys called us and you sat with us under the tree and told us about the disease. But with COVID, what are you hiding? That's why they didn't want to vaccinate. They felt like <laughs> they are being excluded for, from a certain mm. uh, conversation. So I think the engagement, the treatment literacy, and, and really empowerment of communities is important very early on. Yeah, but I think it, it's not a big mountain that we can handle. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for those excellent comments. I really think you hit on so many of the key points of, of what this is going to mean, shifting from this public health approach where we had millions of clients all on the same daily oral fixed dose combination pill. Um, what does this mean for supply chain? You know, what is what can we learn from other places like family planning? Um, and I'm really glad you raised the Dolly Tiger Bear example as well, because I, I do think there were a lot of important learnings there for everybody on, on the importance of engaging community and listening, um, listening to community as well. Um, so fantastic. Dr. Momani, I'm, I'm curious to hear your, your thoughts on this. Thank you so much, Caroline. And I think uh, my sentiments are quite close to our colleague from South Africa, maybe giving the Kenyan context. And currently we have about 1.3 million people on treatment uh, who are on ART with very good uh, suppression outcomes. And of course our approach, again, as articulated in our guidelines, is using a, a client-centered approach, whereby the client is always given all the information and makes a choice based on information that they have. Uh, and we are, of course, obligated always to provide the best available options uh, for treatment. Uh, I think now thinking about uh, client choice in the in the, in the, the context of long acting uh, injectables, I think one of the things I was thinking about is really the issue around what are some of the things that you'll have to consider. One is that there's already kind of an established medical eligibility criteria uh, that we have to think about. And this by itself, we know that the, the, the clients who will go on this treatment, one, have to be have an detectable viral load, they have to have some kind of documentation of uh, no resistance to some of the, the molecules and also uh, no previous or current treatment failure. So that by itself, I think, will uh, will kind of already categorize, I'll say, if I use the word, our clients and say that this there are those who will not be eligible medically. But then now we have now the interplay of the, the client's choice, uh, whereby now the client, for one reason or another, issues around the frequency of the visit to the facility, issues around uh, the the injections, those who are comfortable giving getting the injections are not comfortable getting the injections. Some clients might have fears about uh, some of maybe the adverse events of the medications, including the, the site injections and so on. So some clients will, once given the information, might also choose, they might be medically eligible, but now still choose not to uh, get into the injectable and to remain with the, the oral medications. So basically what this means that again, uh, uh, going to what our colleague from South Africa said, that we are likely to end up with a system whereby we have to have both uh, the injectables and the orals available uh, and offered at our facilities to our clients. And therefore, what does this mean? 
I think one, it means that we really have to engage a lot in terms of one uh, uh, the recipient of care uh, um, education and si simplifying materials for them. How can they understand what, that, what does this mean? How frequent am I required? What are some of the, the, the effects? What are some of the benefits and so on? But then what this also means is that as a program also, it means that we have to provide both choices, uh, both the injectable and the oral at the same time, depending on the numbers and the choice of our clients. And I think this is where you know, it brings in the complexities around the supply chain, how to ensure that we have both the issues around possible. I mean, we have seen when you do this kind of transitions and where you're offering two options at the same time while scaling up one and probably scaling down one, there's always risk of either overstocking and also risks about uh, risks for um, also even stock, I mean, uh, sorry, expires and so on. So I think these are some of the considerations, but really, I think one of the things that really in summary we love to engage so much is on client education, uh, providing as much information as possible and allowing them to make a choice based on either their medical eligibility uh, criteria or some of the personal or social factors that might come into play. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Dr. Mamani, are you, I think you're on mute, but it looks like you might still be talking. No, I'm, 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 I'm done. I'm done. Talking. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so thank you so much. Really excellent um, comments there as well. And I'm, I'm glad you, you picked on this piece around client education, um, because if we're serious about providing choice, that is, that is essential. But how do you do that in a way that you're not uh, requiring an hour for the healthcare worker to sit down and kind of fully go through the benefits and risk and considerations of each product to the client? We know we don't have that, that kind of time. I mean, really nowhere in the world, including in high income settings, do you have that kind of time you know, with your healthcare provider? So thinking about the materials that can be developed, the training that's required um, so that you can really um, actually provide an, an educated choice for clients is going to be essential. And I don't, you know, I think there, there are probably learnings from family planning. Um, and increasingly, I think there will be learnings from the HIV prevention space, but certainly this feels like a, an essential area if we wanna get serious about offering client choice. Um, so thank you so much for those comments. Um, I know our colleague from Nigeria, Mrs. Achi, was having uh, connection issues. Let me see if she's back. No. I think Caroline, I see her on the oh. list. Oh, here we go. Let's see, is she back? Hi, can yes, you hear us? Yes, I'm back. Yes, I'm back. Okay, I'm back, great. Caroline. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, I, I know you <laughs> dropped, but just curious for your perspective um, from Nigeria on this topic of uh, how Nigeria would grapple with shifting to a system of, of allowing client choice um, in, in ART. You know, what would that look like? What would some of the challenges be um, in, in Nigeria? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Carolyn. Um, just like uh, when Zach was doing that presentation, um, he mentioned about um, client's choice to medication being a basic human right. Um, so right of choice. So all we are saying about um, pharmaceutical care, clinical care, nursing care, it's all about clients being part of the, um, of the treatment plan, having a client as part of the treatment plan. So in Nigeria, we have a well, a good established structure. So I don't think it will cause a new, any kind of challenge, much challenge in the country because um, in the country already, we have a very well established structure and system where we have, especially when looking at the supply aspect of it from the supply chain angle, we are already, we have a well established structure and system. We have the national qualification theme and we have the technical working group. Um, all this, we have to ensure commodity security in the country. And also in the HIV program, we have a lot of regimen and different people being in the different kinds of regimen. So it's not as if it's only one regimen with no number of people having one drug. So already we manage different commodities in the country. So um, for the HIV program also, we are going to learn from the experiences of the other program, uh, like the family planning program that already in the country considers 
does their treatment based on the method that a client needs. So it's not like uh, one um, shoe fits all. So different clients have their different methods. So definitely we are going to learn from the experiences of these other methods. Also, additionally, it is also very critical when we are having that kind of new direction to define eligibility criteria of the population that will utilize the commodity. So when you have it, it will form as a kind of baseline for the, uh, for the quantification. So when you have that as a baseline for the quantification, baseline number for the quantification, so that going forward, when you now have a consumption pattern, you can now use that. So in the country, when we have such things, such new direction, we also form a kind of transition plan. Why do we have that transition plan? Transition plan helps us to know the number of people based on the different criteria you're going to put in, bring into the program gradually, you know, you're going to transition them gradually until you get, uh, you reach what you're looking out for. So um, in not only, but once we have that transition plan, there will also be need to monitor, active monitoring of the transition plan. So that active monitoring of the transition plan basically will help us to make sure that there is no deviation from projections. So that and also adjustments can be made when we have our biannual supply planning. So in the country, I don't think it's going to pose huge problems. Like I said earlier, we have different regimen with different people in the regimen. So it will just be like adding to the number of products that we are managing. Thank you. That's great. That's really helpful. Um, and, and also helpful to hear your your confidence that this is that this is possible. And um, uh, I think maybe as, as Dr. Mawela has said, not going to be a, a mountain too high to too high to climb. Um, I really like what you said in terms of the active monitoring piece. We see that with any new drug introduction, but of course it's going to be even more complicated in the context of choice um, because we're not going to be able to predict as much. Um, you know, uh, how many clients will choose one product versus the other. Um, and I also totally agree with you on, on the points around family planning um, and just the experience there of, of offering uh, method choice. When I think about family planning, though, and the experience of a lot of women in different countries, um, one of the challenges, of course, also with family planning, the reality of it is that, yes, many choices may be offered in a country, but a woman going to a particular site, you know, may only have one or two options. It may not be the choice she wanted. Um, so that really makes me think about some of the supply chain challenges as well. And, and how can we learn from what the family planning space has done really well for many years now and where the challenges, you know, remain? Um, okay, great. So I want to go back to Dr. Mawela, um, because one of the findings from the assessment uh, in South Africa was that South Africa could be open to engaging the private sector to facilitate delivery of long acting treatments, which I think has a lot of really exciting potential there. Um, so what are some of the advantages that you see of working with the private sector to deliver long acting treatment? Um, and uh, you know, to, uh, I, I guess, bias with what I think maybe one of the challenges would be, but, you know, how can we, in working for the private sector as well to deliver these long-acting treatments, how can you also ensure that there's coordination with the government system? Mm -hmm. um, so very curious for your thoughts on this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's a, it's a very relevant uh, point uh, in terms of uh, what the key opinion leaders noted but also in terms of South Africa and where we are. You know, we are now striving for universal health coverage. There is now a push for what we call the, net, the national health uh, insurance. And uh, that already tells us that as government, we know that we cannot achieve everything on our own. And therefore collaboration and partnerships, you know, are very, very, very um, important. Um, the, the second part is that Government has a lot of responsibilities, but also there might be elements where they are not necessarily, you know, uh, having enough technical expertise in uh, to facilitate, you know, the whole process. For example, 
when we talk about actually on the poll, I chose policy and registration as a <laughs> as probably one because I know in South Africa, if we can bypass that stage, uh, the other things I think you know uh, um, would happen. And time and again, we find ourselves as clinicians being ready for certain uh, products, but unfortunately, at the policy level, the guidelines level, uh, the registration process, the types of documentation, you know, so if you start at that level, you realize that there's a certain kind of technical expertise uh, that is required to engage with the regulators uh, in terms of registration of these products, in terms of negotiating the pricing, in terms of doing the economics. So already uh, there is already a need, you know, um, at that level to look at uh, collaborations, you know, and, and partnerships. Um, the second part is if you look at the supply chains, you know, private sector organizations have already established a whole lot of supply chain processes. They already have a lot of uh, capacity. Uh, if you look at South Africa's response to the COVID-19 and the introduction of uh, vaccines that needed strict control in terms of a uh, cold chain, you know, um, we relied a lot on the private sector. And in addition to that, at the delivery level, where the service was actually, you know, needed, uh, most of the big private pharmacies, some of the community pharmacists, you know, the the the, the private uh, GPs who are also part part of the private sector. And when we discuss the, this collaboration, it's important to know that our treatment is already decentralized. The question is, how closer can we get to the clients? And if you consider that this is an injectable. And I think that is where you'll see that the collaboration with the private sector is going to be very, very crucial because government might not have capacity to be able to provide an injection sort of service, you know, very close um, to the patient. And uh, maybe linked to that is to also appreciate that South Africa has over 5 million uh, patients on ARVs. The majority are stable. The majority are already taking treatment away from the health uh, facilities, you know, and we don't want them to come back. <laughs> so I think, you know, I see a lot of uh, great uh, uh, opportunities. I was even reflecting on, I think, 2018, uh, 19, there's one NGO that celebrated one million, you know, circumcisions. And I looked at how did they do it? It's actually through collaboration with government, but also, you know, your, your your private GPs who are already functioning, you know, in the communities and the, their services could easily be re, repositioned and repurposed, you know, to be integrated so that, you know, care can be delivered um, at that level. So I think that the, uh, this whole process, if you look at a technical capacity to put together things like guidelines, you know, we need a lot of uh, technical support from uh, development partners, uh, you know, from universities, you know, um, and so on. So to be honest, I think that there's a lot of um, advantages in terms of coordination, just two statements. Uh, from from my side is that we have managed to do well through coordinating uh, platforms which are established you know by government you saw even during covid response there was a national coordinating body and it has a it was a multi sector a, a, a platform which involved uh, NGOs, you know, churches, but also technical um, experts. And within the National Department of Health, there is a number of such uh, fora uh, which can then help, you know, to coordinate. The second part is we do also have guideline writing committees, you know, where, where, where the, pub, the, the private sector can also uh, participate. I think in terms of coordination, my last point is around data and MNE and the sharing of data. And I saw when we now track our 95, 95 targets in South Africa, uh, private sector data is already integrated uh, in that space. And I think as soon as we are able to share data, basically, usually that is the missing link. And I know that it is at the heart of collaboration. If we are able to coordinate the, the sharing of data, MNE systems, most of the program issues are easily uh, doable. Uh, thank you. <laughs> so much for for those excellent uh, uh comments there um i want to was just going to the q and a i see we've got some questions coming in um so zach actually maybe i can turn it over to you for um the question that came in um uh zach let me turn over to you on on the first question there 
Thanks, Carolyn. The one on um, timing. Yes, so um, a question about the excitement for long acting products, but how that excitement will stand up if the reality is that it will these products, at least the current ones or, or one of the current ones will require more frequent interactions with the health, the healthcare system. I typed up a brief response, uh, but I think it's a great question. Um, and I think it's one that we, I don't know if we have an answer to, and I think like anything in this sort of new paradigm will, will depend on individual clients. Some clients may prefer an injectable, even if it means doing it every two months. Some clients may say, you know what, I would rather just not go to the health system um, at all if possible. And so, uh, you know, may prefer daily oral pills. One thing that we do see a lot in the literature in the prevention space um, are, are discrete choice experiments where they ask these, they ask these questions, you know, would you prefer an injectable or a pill? What if it was 80% effective or 70% effective? And it allows uh, the researchers to sort of rank preferences. I mean, I don't know of any that have been done for HIV treatment. And I think Definitely a research gap, something that could be interesting to look into to understand these preferences and how different treatment uh, components um, may rank higher or lower in importance to uh, to various clients. But again, I think this is what's going to be tricky. It's going to be an individual client uh, client preference piece. Thanks so much, Zach. Yeah, and just to say, Unitate and Chai, uh, together with Africa, hosted a community consultation around this very topic last year, and there was a really interesting. Uh, they call it a steeplechase exercise. It was very interesting to see um, just the the difference, you know, and uh, across individuals. Some people are okay taking the pill every day, and they're very happy that they only have to go to the clinic twice a year to get, you know, that big uh, six month pill bottle of TLD, and they're they're good with that. Others said, "I am so sick of taking a pill every day. This is a daily reminder that I have HIV, and boy, I would love to go into the clinic, even if I have to go every other month for the injection." So. Um, I, I the most striking thing to me from that was just the um, that exercise and participating uh, with our Africa colleagues was the diversity, right, of of uh, choice and and preferences. Um, so okay, great. I other good questions coming in the chat um, that we're probably going to run out of time for. I but I did want to. We're sort of getting to this theme of of how. Um, long acting treatment can be delivered and some of the challenges with it. And we did have a question um, for both Nigeria and Kenya because the assessment found that injections could only be given at facilities. Um, obviously that would pose challenges for, for DSD models. Um, uh, you know, how you're not going to be able to do any kind of community care um, or delivery for uh, or potential of, of self injections. Uh, down the road. So I'm curious how the national programs in Kenya and Nigeria are thinking about DSD as it relates to long acting HIV treatments. Do you think it's possible that um, policies around injection location requirements could be changed um, to better facilitate DSD? Do you see that? Do you see that evolving? Um, what do you think some of the challenges here will be? Okay. All right, can I start with Kenya? Okay, do I go first, Nigeria? Okay, um, so um, in Nigeria, we all know we practice the DSD model. And of course, the policy for now in the country is that to take injections, of course, you have to go to the facilities to be given to you by the well-trained um, uh, medical uh, healthcare workers trying to give injections. However, for this uh, inject in my country, I don't think that we pose much problem. We are going to maybe walk through uh, ways to change the policies to suit um, the community uh, taking into the injections. Because one, at the community level, we have to look at the capacity of people at the community to be able to give these injections. So the policy change can go into the direction of looking at the community for the capacity of the medical people at the community to be able to give injection. And where that is not possible, there will be capacity building for other cadre of um, healthcare workers to be able to deliver these injections at the, uh, at the community level. And not only that, also capacity around how to, because the, the whole uh, uh, questions people will be asking, we how do you manage the shops? Waste management of shops at the community. So we'll be looking at also waste management um, of shops and other things around the community mm -hmm. level. So I'm not to impose a 
health hazards. And not only mm. that, we work with the other units in the ministry. There are these units that are into injection safety and they have done a lot. So we have to go have collaboration with them to know what they have done in management of injections at the community level. So basically what we'll be looking at is uh, collaboration with um, other MDS in the country and just know how to be able to deliver this injectable in a such a way that it does not pose harm to the community and even to the patient taking it. So when you look at injection sites, when you look at adherence, when you also look at uh, being able to, for the patient to pharmacovigilance and other ADRs that might be associated since they take it uh, at the community so they can be brought back to the facility where they impose any danger. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Dr. Mamani, if, if you wanted to quickly add any any thoughts and then unfortunately we're getting to the top of top of the hour already. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, again, um, a very similar context like Nigeria and um, we already know that we have more, almost close to 60% of our patients or clients who are actually accessing treatment with these various models. And uh, But still what we are saying is that what introducing these injectables will do probably will have to resort to all these clients accessing through this uh, uh, treatment through that outside the facility coming back on a, a month to monthly basis. So uh, what are the options that we do have and some of the opportunities? One. I think we already have what we call healthcare worker-led models within the community. So is that an opportunity for us to, to be able to deliver these injectables in the community uh, through the healthcare workers who are actually at the moment able to refill these medications? Uh, two is the issue around, I think what she said about infection control. I think that's something that we really have to think very strongly. What, uh, what are some of the equipment they have to carry, the injection, the safety injection boxes, uh, and some of the materials to ensure that they're able to deliver this if you have to provide it in the community. Number two is also the issue around providers. You know that sometimes when they do actually meet for, I mean, to collect the medication to the community IT groups, I mean, they're sitting under a tree in a school and so on. So what does this mean in terms of privacy and to be able to administer these injections using privacy? So we maybe availing things like screens, uh, I mean, and, and so on at the, at the community level. But then I think also just similar to South Africa, we have also now also now launched what you call the private sector engagement framework. We are, we, are, we are opening up the space in the community pharmacies to be able to deliver HIV uh, services and commodities can be delivered there. And we also seeing this as an opportunity to be able to leverage on some of the community pharmacies where now it means that a client can actually pop in into the, the pharmacy and be able to get the injection or what we call maybe a refill of the injection within the community pharmacy. And so, so, so some of the opportunities we see, but definitely we'll have to rethink about our DST models and maybe uh, review our guidelines in terms of who can deliver an injection, where they deliver and where can it be delivered safely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm, I'm seeing a number of questions pop into the chat um, that I will maybe try and cover uh, really quickly. Marty, you had a, a great question on um, uh, just something that actually Mrs. Atu, I think, had raised earlier in terms of like the eligibility criteria and what kind of complexity that will will add um, to this. I think we saw, of course, with TLD when there was that phase where there was the concern with the NTD safety signal, putting that eligibility criteria in limited to women um, was a bit of a, a bit of a nightmare as as we saw. So I, I think this is a really important question and, and one that requires further discussion. Um, a few really interesting comments that have come in the chat, less so questions. Question from Heather, yes, absolutely. So actually our first step in putting together this analysis was to pull from previous, um, <coughs> excuse me, assessments and uh, landscaping that had been done on the prevention side. Um, there, of course, is, is overlap and there's, there's a lot of areas of non-overlap too as well when you look at HIV prevention versus HIV treatment, but so much has been done on the prevention side. And so we that was our starting point. And then we kind of built from that and pulled out what are some of the differences really in the treatment space versus prevention. So yes, absolutely. That was the core part to the process. And sorry, we didn't highlight that. Um, and then a couple questions on generics. So um, the first long acting product to be licensed and and you know it, it took some time and and took a lot of community advocacy to make that happen was of course cabotegravir but i believe is only generically licensed for um the prevention indication still so um <coughs> for that product generics 
are um, you know busy developing it, and I I think that with um, some further uh, uh, incentive and, and financing um, from donors that we will be able to accelerate generic development for that product. I think for any other long acting product, we're going to need to see a similar uh, process and hopefully an accelerated one. So we need to see the products licensed more quickly um, and we need to see um, the generics incentivized to rapidly produce the, the product. So we are we are years away still from um, a, a generically available long acting product, certainly for treatment. Um, and uh, yeah, a, a lot a lot that needs to be done um, in that space for sure. Um, so I'm so sorry, we've already gone over. I wanna thank my amazing panelists. Uh, I feel like we could talk about this topic for hours. I really, really appreciate it. Um, it's, it was so interesting to hear, hear from all of you. I wanna thank Zach for the excellent presentation. Thank the governments of, of South Africa, Kenya, and Nigeria for their participation in this. Um, thank our community partners who've been critical in guiding this. Um, and thank Unitaid who uh, supported um, all of this with, with their funding to CHAI. Um, thank you everybody for attending. We had a, a huge um, a participant list on this call. We really appreciate it. Um, and we hope to continue this conversation. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.